Hello and welcome to episode 20 of Crucible Bootcamp. I'm your host, King Koala, and today we're going to be watching an a uh, uh, player named Zolani13 on Cauldron. He's playing Blade Dancer and he's using a Scout Sniper loadout. So let's go ahead and get into it. So Cauldron's one of my favorite matches. I love uh, talking about it. Love looking at reviews. So we see that he's playing Salvage. And Salvage is an interesting game mode because due to the scoring system, um, it's kind of a broken scoring system in that it favors the defender. It doesn't really favor the when you actually cap the point. So let's cover real quickly how the scoring system works in Salvage. Um, when you cap the point, it's 100 points per person that caps the point, just like a control point. Uh, you have to be on the point to get credit for it when it finishes, and so you can get a total of 300 points for it. Um, if you're not on the point and someone else caps it, you lose out on that 100 points. So every person that's on the, the cap point is worth one kill. When you capture the point, everyone that stayed on the point also gets rewarded again, this time in the form of 200 points. So 600 total points for capturing, 300 points for starting it in the first place for a grand total of 900 points. Now during the time that the salvage relic is out, I believe it's 45 seconds, that's about enough time to fight two, possibly three engagements, depending on the distance between spawns where the salvage point um, is. So in Cauldron, it's really confined. You're likely going to get into three fights before the, the point finishes. So that means in order to capture the point successfully, you'll more, most, more likely gain at least 900 po 600 to 900 additional points just by killing the enemy team. That's pretty good, right? But here's the problem. There's no incremental point gain as the time goes on, which means it's incredibly risky because if at any point you lose one of those three set engagements, the point will get uh, taken off, and that's a, f a 450 point gain for the enemy team. So basic math says that if 300 or three people stay on the point for 300 points, you lose one of your engagements, so that's 300 additional points away from you, effectively negating the fact that you even capped the point, and now you're on top of that losing an additional 450 points, you can see why you don't want to cap the point at all. It's incredibly risky, but when you play solo salvage, you can't really do anything about that. So the best thing you can do when you play solo salvage, if your teammates are capping the point, you need to be on the point with them. You need to get as many points as possible out of that point, out of the, the, the relic. So he's using Scout Sniper um, and Fleet Footed. I'm not sure if his longbow has Quick Draw on it. It kind of looks like it does, just because, just based on the animation time, how fast it's coming out. So then I can understand why he would run Fleet Footed. But they get the three kills and they instantly get 450 points. So you can see there was only, if you look at the bottom right here, there was only one person that capped that salvage point on the enemy team. And they got three kills and 450 points. They're already up 700 points. That's two full team wipes within the first minute of the match. That is a, a very big deficit to start off a match on if you're the enemy team. And it's a really good lead. Now, Scout Sniper has a lot of issues with it. So now that he's died, let's discuss some of those issues. First issue with Scout Sniper is... The guns exist in, their, their effective ranges are the same. Um, sniper is going to be slightly longer, just because the one hit factor. Uh, and scouts, unless you, you're specking for range, which you, which you don't really need to do, because there's no extremely long range maps in this game that are common. Um, if you are going to find yourself on those maps, it's going to be in the classic sixes list, and those maps are going to be like Sky Shock or First Light. Um, I think Bastion's the other one. But uh, th there's three maps, and they're all extremely large. They were built for combined arms, which is a now defunct uh, game type. No one plays it anymore. And you don't really need that kind of loadout, unless you're specifically going in there. And even then, you still probably don't need that kind of loadout. So because these two weapons exist in the same space where you want to use them, you're basically, the, the advantage is you're always going to have the right weapon for the situation when you're at mid to long range. No matter what you have out, you can use it effectively. 
The problem is once either you close the gap for your opponent or your opponent just closes the gap naturally because you're re it's really easy to move through cover in this game and to close just just to move around corners to get close to someone. If you aren't constantly backpedaling or uh, repositioning, you're going to get pushed into that mid to close mid range where your guns are basically going to be useless. The worst thing for you to do in this loadout is to push someone. That is the absolute worst thing to do. And as you can see here, he gets very lucky he doesn't immediately get shotgunned. Immediately, well, right off the bat, of course. A better play obviously would have just been to open that door down there and to hard scope up into it. Or even stand on the bridge, wait for her and wait for someone to come out. This position here, this is great for you. You have a nice sight line on whoever's in B, and you have a good escape route by backing up and going around the door. And you have two options. You can go either right or left, depending on where you want to pull someone or where your teammates are. But what you don't want to do is just push in to challenge. You don't have to act like you have somewhere to be with this kind of loadout. Because you don't need to be anywhere. You need to just pick people off as they move around the map. The, the power of of really long range or really short range um, loadouts are that you can effectively keep people from moving in certain ways. So if you use an all short range loadout, like an auto rifle and a, and a shotgun, um, it's on you to properly move in and out of cover and never engage in mid-range. You never want to engage in mid-range. The only time you want to move into mid-range is if you're running a Titan, and that Titan is a striker, and you have a Juggernaut shield up. That is it. And even then, I would still not recommend you Juggernaut shielding straight at someone. You should be attempting to do it from the side. That is going to be your most effective way to push as a Juggernaut striker Titan. If you have to push forward because maybe you're just the front and it's your job to push forward while your teammates flank, then that's fine. But just know that if your Juggernaut shield goes down, you should probably stop the engagement and move out of the way. You don't actually have to kill someone when you're pushing at them with Juggernaut. You don't need to get into range when you're pushing with Juggernaut. You just need to be a distraction and cause fire to go onto you and off of your teammates and let your teammates actually do the, do the work. So now that... Again, he's there's been one guy on this point. I believe it was one guy. Double check the score. Okay, two guys. So potentially they have the 200 from both capping it and 400 if they actually seize the relic. So it's only 600 points. So that's a lot of work that they have to do for a point advantage of 150 points compared to if the team, like he, he just died here, so now that's just a 2v2. Yeah, it was two guys. His teammate got there just in time. So this is actually one of those relics on this particular map that I would be okay with trying to defend because it's really, it's really uh, hard to push onto this point. Um, it'd be easy in this case just because our hero has a sniper rifle and a scout rifle, so if he ever gets pushed, he just dies. But if he picks these long sight lines before they jump up from underneath, then he'll be okay. And you see him having to hip fire his scout rifle here. That is not what you want to be doing with your scout rifle, unless you have no other choice. And unfortunately, with the sniper rifle, you don't have any other choice. But with this particular scout, it takes him five body shots to kill someone. Now, that's a lot. You need two headshots and two body shots or five body shots. That's a long time to be engaged with a shotgunner hip firing them. So pushing all the way out like this is okay, but you're not really gaining any map control by doing this. You should try be trying to push into B. You're exposed. It would have been better for him to be on the lamp, but this is a good disengage. I like the disengage. He's going to reposition. He's going to his teammate. But, like I said, you only get points for capturing the relic if you stand on it. You need to stand on it. This, now that you've missed it, you're out three full kills, potentially, because you were too busy waiting for a special, which wasn't going anywhere.
So this is the importance of picking a target. And why you should mostly have your sniper rifle out in mid to long range rather than your scout rifle. And that's because you want the people that you're fighting to die as fast as possible. You don't want them to hang out and team fire your teammates, which ends up happening. If he had gotten a body shot on this guy, he would have disengaged from the fight. Ideally. Some people are stupid and they stay in the fight and they get team shot. That's fine. But if you hit that guy with a body shot with your sniper rifle and he disengages, that's just as good as killing him because now your team can focus on other targets that are higher priority. If he comes back in, which it might be smart for him to do because now he's, you know, the heat's off of him, he's completely disengaged, then you gotta turn around and finish him off. But you don't need to chase after a kill. Your main priority here is defending. And mostly defending from cover. You can see these challenges, basically, he was he could get fired from basically anywhere in this room. They're in blue room or pool. And by being here, in this position, he can get fired through the door. Coming from bones, uh, bottom bones or top bones. Based on how he's positioned. This, this pillar here might save him from someone from top bones, but... Because he's strafing around, we don't know exactly how how his body's going to look to the enemy team. So if you are going to challenge or protect, I guess, would be a better word for it, it's best to go further back into the room. So that's going to cut off this completely. And it's going to protect you from someone in bones. Or you can hide out around here and cover those same locations. This is a bad idea with this particular loadout, but if you have a shorter loadout, this is a good spot too. Or the other side. But you don't want to be in the center of the room. It's If they push in and they get on the relic here, there's the timer is going to start filling up, right? It's going to start filling up. So you know that, that exactly where they're going to be. They can't move, really, when they're disabling it. So it's pretty easy for you to just move around and kill them. Or get shots on them. Or whatever you need to do. You don't have to sit on the point. Like I said, there's another 450 points. Luckily that they, they've been keeping up in kills, so they still have that, you know, 700 point lead that they've had since the beginning of the game. That was a perfect opportunity to just get a body shot on him. If he got a body shot on him there with a sniper instead of with his scout rifle, then he would have been dead and he wouldn't have had to push all the way out like this. It's really good team fire by his teammate, and this is the first big mistake that he makes. Is he just got a super, and unfortunately he's not going to use it for the rest of the game. When you get your super, especially as a blade dancer, it's not a particularly strong super. It's better. It's a better super the worse the players that you're playing against are. Um, that's not very nice to say, but better players know how to deal with arc blade. Mostly that's just team firing it. You're very exposed. You have to close the gap to melee range. And even though you do have 50% super armor, it's still really hard to really effectively close the gap and deal with shotgunners. Because even just a shotgun melee is going to end up trading with the blade dance. So one for one, that's not really what you want with a super. Really, the power of using your super there is pull, pushing them off of the point. You saw that only one guy, again, capped the point. Let's move back a little bit further. Okay. You see his teammates there, capping the point. Obviously that's dumb on his teammates' part, but he should be sitting there, capping the point, not hopping off, hoping for the best. At this point, now they're down an extra 300 points, potentially. Once someone's pushing you like this and you have your super, just use it. Your priority is not conserving it, your priority is making sure they don't get this. That's everything. Again, still have your super up? Just push at them. It's heavy. Get them off of a he get them off of a heavy block. I know this isn't a sweat, so get them off of a heavy block with your super. Even if you trade, hopefully there'll be time for you to get yourself up and go challenge the other heavy your team challenges the other heavy with your heavy. When heavy spawns, don't wait for your teammates. Don't be afraid. Don't challenge anyone. Just pick it up. 
Because if he had picked it up before this point, he would have killed the shotgunner that came in the room as opposed to just picking it up and giving them a free kill. Obviously, I'm okay with that play because the enemy team didn't get it. Again, teammate being stupid, he's just constantly capping the point. You gotta be on it. That's not his fault in that particular instance, but again, just trying to drill that into you. This particular challenge is problematic because of your positioning off spawn. You jumped right out of cover. This is a complete sight line from bridge all the way to spawn. And this is a, a, one of my favorite spots to kill people in because I'm a jerk and I like killing people off spawn. If you wait on bridge or you wait just off bridge on green side um, lamp and then wait for them to when you think they're going to spawn and then jump on the bridge, you'll see them spawn where he's jumping right now. And you'll just kill them off spawn. It's awful. It's also completely exposed. So you don't want to be jumping here. If you're going to challenge someone, you want to be all the way back on stairs. You want to be up here on around diving board, hopefully with your shoulder to a wall. Or just around this uh, the capture point, the relic. Because the relic, keep in mind that the relic creates cover for you. There's Salvage is a really cool uh, mode because you have lots of cover where cover isn't normally. So you got to take advantage of that. It makes your engage it makes engagements that you normally wouldn't be safe taking completely safe. It also allows you to get different elevations of challenges. You can actually jump on the relic to challenge someone. Most people don't expect you to be shooting from on top of a relic, whether it's active or not. So he goes to support his teammates, and this is a good. This is, a good, this is where you want to be with this loadout, on, uh, on bridge like that. Now, you saw him use tether, don't walk into the tether. You don't need to challenge the tether. Again, your main priority is securing the relic. You don't need to pop your super here, obviously, because there's a tether in the way, but don't push towards it, especially after you just saw your teammate die. If you do get tethered, shoot the tether. The tether lasts not quite as long as you shoot it. Hopefully your teammates will help you out by shooting it. Okay, off spawn we're moving to the pool. Again, keep those long sight lines with this with this loadout. Right around that corner, you don't want to push all the way out in a pool, you want to keep your shoulder to that wall. Give yourself a, you know, a very short time to move back into cover instead of a long time of exposure. So this is going to give you that sight line into the red lamps. It's also going to give you a sight line into the around this uh, this bend here. He moves back into Bones. This is problematic because you're not really supporting your teammates. You're not really doing anything at this point. And you're better, like you did, you're best off just running away because you're going to be outnumbered. A really good spot to hold if you have a long range uh, loadout is top bridge. Because it's gonna, you're going to cover basically all the doors in B. You can move out on the bridge and cover off spawn. So Bones... Uh, outside bone spawn, which is the green room full of all the bones. And diving board, which is where that plank sticks out. Over here, uh, over here. Or just A stairs. Like I said, killing someone off spawn. A good priming grenade. Nice hop off. Let's his teammate finish him off. Again, another perfect opportunity to use your super right here. You're between two people, you can pick one and take them out real quickly. Also, that third person view, really nice for when you're in close quarters combat. <laughs> Unfortunately, again, teammate decided he wants to cap the relic. So now they're actually behind because of how many times the enemy team has just taken the relic away from them. They're definitely up on kills. Like, they're winning most of their engagements, but the problem isn't that they're winning engagements. The problem is that his teammate's just giving them way too many points for free. And everything adds up. Everything adds up. A less extreme example of this is giving an enemy team reses in threes like skirmish or elimination. So one trade that results in a res is plus 50 for the enemy team and it's plus 150 towards their total, right? 
it's good if you trade and you get a res, right? Because you're up 50 points. But it's not quite so good as just getting a free kill because the enemy team has pushed closer to finishing the game. And it's, an, it's, it's a concept called non-zero. It's, it's a non-zero push towards where you want to go. So I will, I will try to reinforce that, hey, it's okay if you trade. Like, that's probably the best of the worst case scenarios. But you should still be aiming, and the purpose of the show is to aim for those engagements where you get a kill cleanly. And you don't, it don't, you don't help your enemy team finish the round. You don't give them an opportunity to charge their super. You don't give them an opportunity to come back into the game. Basically want to choke out the enemy team. Another close quarters area where your super is, you know, it's really, it would be a really good point to use your super right there. This escape, I like this escape, I like the backpedal. You saw he died earlier to that, uh, that scatter grenade, so he moves past it as opposed to where he was backpedaling behind it. That's one of those, uh, that's one of those situations where you had no choice but to get into shotgun range. It was either you're going to die to a scatter grenade or you're going to die to a shotgun. At least this way, you did put shots on him, so your melee, when it connected, it was going to kill him. That's, that's really good. That's what we want to do if we have no other choice but to kill our way out. You want to go down fighting. You don't want to kind of be like, oh, you know, he got me, I'm in melee range or whatever, just kill me. No, all, you know, even if you have no more shots left in your primary and you have to take out your sniper and try to no-scope, you just do it because you should always go down fighting. You see, he finally decides to pop a super at the end there, but it's way too late. It's just, And you can see, even though they did really well in, initially, it really was on his positioning and attempting to stay alive and protect that relic and the importance of keeping it protected because those 450s, they added up to, you know, 3,000 points. That's a lot of relics where, you know, they gave up for free. Let's see if they can see the score screen. Yeah, five deploys. So I think they they got two, I want to say. They got two um, captures or one capture. But that's, you know, 1,350 points at least that they lost. Because they were trying, that's, you know, 14 kills is a huge deficit. So, here's my favorite map, as usual. So, if we're going to, let's say, so, two things. First is, if you're going to play Salvage, do not capture the Relic. And if you do, make sure it's an easy one to capture. If it's not an easy one to capture, leave it alone. Just fight people around it. You don't need to capture it. If the enemy team decides to capture it, that's your opportunity to get a huge point point boost. Now they have Bungie has said that they are changing the score system to something different in Rise of Iron. I imagine it's something that's more progressive. Like you get more points the longer it goes, so it's just as good for the team capturing as it is for the team um, disabling. I imagine that's it's some some something like that. So obviously this, this particular review will be a little adjusted for salvage in the, in the future, but for the time being, at least for the next month, don't capture the point. There's no point to it. The second thing is you just can't, I can't in good fit in, you know, in good conscience recommend that you use a completely long range uh, loadout because the way the movement functions in this game it's too easy to close the gap than it is to create a gap so i can i can in good conscience recommend that you use an auto rifle and a shotgun because how easy it is to close the gap uh through cover because there's just a tremendous amount of cover everywhere if you're just aware of it and you avoid completely the locations where you're exposed um so on this particular map, some locations that are completely exposed and you should never push are through the bridge here. So if you have to go all the way across, you're pretty exposed to anyone hanging out over here on red side or over here on green side around the, around the lamps. 
that's a bad area for shotgunners. But luckily for you, if you are a shotgunner on Cauldron, and you should be, you can go inside. Now, your movement is rather telegraphed just because of the nature of how doors work. They open up, know someone was there, or at least someone, you know, they know you're there, or at least someone was there. So it's televised, but it's through cover. So this space here is a lot shorter than this space here, where you're more likely to get primary or team fi fired down or just picked off with a sniper rifle. So move through cover. Really easy to do with short range, really short range weapons. But with long range weapons, as you can see, if someone is smart and just moves to cover, you basically have no good long sight lines if you're hanging out hard scoping or trying to get angles. It's just too difficult to constantly be on the move and never get punished uh, in close quarters. You don't we don't we don't live in magical Christmas land where that just never happens. I you know, for some people, I'm sure they would love it if they never got pushed by a dirty shotgunner or a jug shield or stormcaller who's you know gonna shop package melee you from Timbuktu. That's gonna happen. It's always gonna happen. You gotta accept that. But you should give yourself the best opportunity to protect yourself if that does happen. So just like in the last episode where we went over a scout sidearm, sidearm's actually a better option. You get the same sight lines with the scout, and you can protect yourself from being pushed with the sidearm. Personally, I would suggest if you like the scout rifle, then you should switch to a shotgun. And just use it defensively. If you're not comfortable shotgunning, you can still use it to defend yourself and still have those same long sight lines that you're used to and that you like. But when you do end up getting pushed, just pull it out and shotgun them. Punish them for pushing you in the first place. That's all you gotta do. I'm not saying you need to turn into a, you know, an MLG warrior by once you've equipped that shotgun, you need to go balls to the wall and get in their face all the time. You don't have to do that. And in my opinion, it's better if you defensively shotgun because it's easier to punish someone for a, for a mistake than to make a perfect play. I haven't seen anyone in this game play perfectly. There's been some matches where maybe someone will play extremely well, but it's never perfect and it's always exploitable. And the easiest thing to exploit is someone's positioning. Now, understanding when their positioning is, is incorrect is just something that comes with time and experience. But for the most part, it's a lot easier to punish positioning with a shotgun than it is with a sniper. A sniper, you have to take these really quick mid-range shots or close mid-range shots if you get pushed. And it's really hard to be comfortable with that or even be good at it. Um, there are, you know, maybe a handful of snipers that I could pick out that I would say, hey, watch this person, they're good in close quarters with their sniper rifle. But I can, you know, you look at any tournament, let's just take the last Farcog tournament, for example, and on every team, there's at least two players, at least two players, if not all the players, are all shotgunning, and they're all very good at it. And if you're going to... And if, if you're going to start arguing, with you, oh, you know, it's too easy, it's too easy, I want a challenge or whatever, that's fine, but don't complain to me when you lose. And don't complain about shotguns either. If you're going to handicap yourself, then you have to understand how a handicap works. And you can't get mad at other people for doing good things when you're doing something stupid. Um, so let's talk, so if you are going to snipe on this map, let's say that you switch off of your uh, scout rifle, you keep the sniper because you like sniping, I can respect that, I also like sniping, let's say you go to an auto rifle or a hand cannon, so where are the sight lines you want to look for on Cauldron? Well the first sight line, like we talked about during the review, that you want to look on is bridge. So bridge gives you these really clean sight lines that are very long, nice and safe. This one, if this door is open, can actually go all the way back here, can go all the way back here, all the way out here, the lamp. So bridge, lots of really nice sight lines. Also, you can't stay on bridge for very long because you could be potentially primaried from most of these locations. 
Especially if you, they're using a pulse rifle or a scout rifle like you are, like you were. So that's one good spot. Other good spots around the coffin in room in B, in gold room. Either side, depending on which angle you need to cover, bones or red room, red lamps. You can come all the way out on the bridge here. This is a really popular spot because people love going to red room. You can just hug that cover, that little wall that's there, and shoot outside. If you're out on green, round lamps, this is a good sight line onto bridge or lower bridge. Same thing with over here on red side. Diving board, like you saw him at the very beginning of the match, you can cover uh, gold bridge, B bridge. You can also cover anyone pushing on the red lamp here. But if you want to snipe from red side, I would highly suggest going on this rock here. This rock here is a head glitch to certain elevations. It also gives you a nice shot on the bridge. And it gives you a nice shot onto here. You're a little exposed behind you, but it's very telegraphed and you can kind of tell when someone's pushing you. And you can also cover red door, bottom red door. This is very confined as far as sniping goes, but it's really safe. And you can drop back into cover if you get pushed. Other areas on the map, if you're on the lamp, there's a nice little head glitch there. If you're all the way back here, you can head glitch back there. Uh, as I showed you earlier in blue room, there's lots of not really long sight lines here to cover. And then you have some really cheeky spots. Mostly, these are going to be all around Red Room. There's these little uh, sarcophagi up floating on top, of the, uh, on top of the structure, right? You can actually float up onto them, mostly from the lamp. You just jump on the lamp, you jump up here, you go all the way around. You can just pick one. Doesn't matter which one, but they're all going to give you different sight lines. Long sight lines. And you're also going to cover pu pushes from anyone from underneath you through these doors here. But you get these really long sight lines here if you think they're going to rotate around uh, through diving board. Most people don't expect you to be up here uh, you know, until you do it a few times and then they're going to expect you to be there. But this is good for at least a couple kills and you, you, that can really set the pace of the game. If you get a couple kills early, you don't have to go up here ever again. They're going to be afraid of you the whole time. And you can go about your business playing normally. But this is a good good spot. These are good spots to have in your back pocket, just in case. Uh, it really helps you slow down the game because it's safe. Because no one expects you to go up there. Although, if you're watching this, people are probably going to expect you to go up there now. Um, most of the spots you don't want to snipe are around the green side. None of the, there's not no real great spots around here that can't be pushed very easily in close quarters. They're all going to be close to mid-range shots in green side, um, unless you're out on the lamps. So if you're a sniper, try to stay away from this area. Um, so if you're on rumble and you're sniping, you want to try to stay on this half of the map and stay away from this half. And if you're on rumble, you have a very nice rotation where you can go blue room to red room to gold room, back to red, through red, back to blue. Kind of like a teardrop. Or you can ignore pool altogether and just move in a circle. Because remember, in, in Rumble, people spawn on the edges of the map. So they're going to spawn around here. And where are they going to move? To the center of the map. Most people move to the center of the map. And that's why B is placed there. B is almost always in the center of the map. Uh, Cauldron is also a short enough map that it's very easy to push all the way across to push spawn. So if you kill people over here in green room, you can push along pool, get here, and already have sights on people spawning on stairs. Or you can push around outside on the bridge, and like I said, you can kill them off, re off res with the sniper rifle. You can also push into B and just control B. It's really hard to push into B properly unless you do a coordinated push from either multiple angles or you all come through the same door and hopefully you've, they've wasted grenades. Don't push all through the same door 
if you know they have grenades up already. As soon as those grenades go down, however, you should probably be pushing immediately as a team. Uh, jumping and sliding. Don't all do the same thing, because you don't want someone pre-aiming at your entire team. That's bad. <laughs> Okay, so kind of a short one today. Uh, after this, I will be streaming some sweats. So um, those are going to happen in, in an hour. We eat some dinner and that. But I really appreciate you guys watching. If you want to send me gameplay, send it to keen at cruciblebootcamp.com. Again, I don't take sixes because they're just too chaotic. You don't get much out of them. Um, so elimination... Trials, Rumble, Salvage, Skirmish. Any weapon loadout, I'm cool with any of them. Some of them I'm a little more biased towards, as you could have experienced today. Um, but hey, if you're open to change and you're open, maybe you know you're att just attached to your sniper, then you can ch you know you can just adapt. I'm always going to tell you to either use the best loadout or the most balanced loadout. Um, these extremes, I don't really like because it really limits your options, and in my opinion, limiting options is a bad thing. Yes, it breeds creativity, which is arguably a good thing, but you should use it as a learning tool, not as a competitive tool. So yeah, if you want to run double sniper to learn angles and to learn positioning, then by all means, go for it. Just don't expect me to say, hey, that's a great loadout, you should use it all the time. Uh, if you like the show, uh, you can support me on Patreon if you want personal tutoring you can support me on patreon i do all that um once the month starts i have a calendar system for people that are signed up for tutoring to sign up on so if you're a backer then you'll be getting the, an email about that at the beginning of the month so you can sign up for your time slots but as always i've been king koala you've been a great audience and class is dismissed thanks for watching